everybody. I'm glad to see our many little squares with your names around. Thanks for uh, taking the time to come to listen to our weekly colloquia, uh, despite the very difficult times. It is my pleasure to introduce John Avon. Um, so John did the MS in Applied Mathematics with Concentration Dynamical Systems with us, and he finished in 2006, I think, and then he switched into the PhD program, uh, the Computational Science Research Center PhD program, and he finished that in 2010, and he worked with Professor Palacios on coupled quantum magnetic devices. After that, I lost track of him, and I just know that he is now the Director of Engineering at HashMap. But uh, maybe John can tell us a little bit about his, his path and where he is right now. Uh, and uh, he's going to be talking about some of the work that he's been doing right now. So thank you, John, for being here. All right. Thank, thanks for having me. Uh, it's really a joy to be invited. I, I was a little bit surprised, but, you know, it gave me the uh, opportunity here to talk about something that has been something that I've been really interested in for quite some time. But before we get in that, you know, where I've been since San Diego State, well, first off, it wasn't just my master's and PhD. I did my undergrad there. For some reason, SDSU just spent a decade trying to get rid of me until they finally did. Um, from there, I went off to NIH, uh, did a postdoc there at the National Institute of Mental Health in the Meg Core, um, core Lab, doing, working with sleep study data and resting MEG. It's kind of uh, pretty fun working on a lot of more dynamic measures, um, entropy-based analysis of brain dynamics uh, is a simple way to put it. Um, from there, I went and in, into the oil and gas industry, started to went to work for a startup where I was working in um, an area now that you could call reservoir characterization. Back then it was, even though reservoir characterization was something that was around, startup had issues simply because we were very heavy into machine learning and what would probably be called data science in oil and gas. And oil and gas wasn't accepting of the kind of the more black box. They don't know the physics behind the solution, how it's going and said, you know what? We like it, it looks cool, but we don't understand it. From there, I went into a period of time where I worked as a seismic processor or, geophys or, or a processing geophysicist, as some people call it. Um, getting down, working in a high-performance compu high computing environment and analyzing seismic data. Did that for a short stint. Wasn't my cup of tea. Got to experience a little bit, realized, hey, you know what? I'm gonna move on. From there, I went back into academia, went to MD Anderson Cancer Center and to work in their biostats department as a computational scientist. Um, there I partook in research in proteomics and radiomics, built software for doing clinical trial design and a half a dozen other things um, from data engineering to full stack software development, whether it was for desktop or for a, the web. So, you know, my career kind of started to diverge greatly from the sciences at that point into a lot more of the software and data so side of the house. From there, I took a job at a oil company doing um, and where I ended up becoming the lead data engineer. So I was the first data engineer they had, started the data engineering department, got into a lot of the Hadoop stack and Spark and all that fun stuff and building data pipelines and productionalizing all the data scientists solutions. It was there that I realized how much when I was working at startups and other places and working with research code, I really truly understood the pain that I was giving to the other software engineers with the code I wrote. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, getting it from researchers and, you know, there's different styles of writing. When you want to put something into production, the game changes. So, you know, started building up around there. And then, then after that, a couple of years in that space, decided to go into consulting. Um, I've been at a few consulting firms since then, um, working as an engineer, data scientist, architect, um, you name it. 
And at this point, um, director of engineering at HashMap. What does that mean? Well, that means that all the IT systems I am responsible for, and the, that's kind of the, the le less fun part. The more fun part is when there's new things that we want to do, new technology directions, um, that's my space. I get to you know kind of lead in that area, introduce new ideas, work with the rest of the, um, as we call ourselves, hash mappers to build out new things. So, you know, that's, that's the last 10 years in a nutshell, gone from scientist to engineer, to somewhat management, somewhat techie. And it's not, none of it leaves me, I love it all. And it's hard to balance when you have so many things that you love. Now, what I wanna to talk to you today is in, in a way you could, it, it's gonna be what's called ML ops in the data science space. But it's my own spin on what ML ops maybe should be from a technology standpoint, um, in contrast to some of the practices that you may see out there. Now, how I look at it too is there's tools that have been built, but they don't necessarily benefit all of, of computational scientific endeavors. Uh, if you're doing machine learning, there's tons of tools. If you're doing something that's more dynamical systems or biologically biology based and uh, more model simulations or analysis of data that isn't really a data science paradigm, there, it, you may not realize there's tools out there or, you, or not know, uh, have a good, uh, there may not be a good tool, simply put. Now, in scientific computing, we want repeatability above, above all. But I wanna talk about in here, we'll get into some other qualities of what in my mind, scientific computing really should endeavor to espouse in the solutions we have and the environments that we work in. Can everybody see the first slide? Yes. Yes. Okay, perfect. Okay, so I'm gonna, I, I've kind of laid this out to three different layers. Where we've been, you know, scientific computing, and I still see this when I work with other data scientists that have come from academia, and uh, that th where their practices currently are, I see where a lot of more industry level data scientists and software engineers work in that space. And then the where we want to go or where we need to go is where a lot of the compute space is going and where, you know, how can we get there? So, and in that I've been playing around for like last week and a half, two weeks, putting together a little bit of a POC. It's not end to end, but I can kind of show some examples of different pieces for it on a framework that could be put, put together to support a more general scientific computing process or pipeline. So, you know, you're gonna see the reflection of me being a lot more in architecture and software engineering and a lot of the pictures in this. It, it, and I can reflect back to this back when I was a student, back, back when I was doing more research space, I would write a piece of code on my own workstation, maybe I was on a Linux box on some cluster, I would save the file somewhere. Maybe if I'm lucky, there was a backup system in case I lost something. Well, a lot of times I'd have a file named old, new, old, new, new, old, old one, new two, and it became impossible to really track which one was which. Even if I had an immaculate way of storing each version and each configuration of my, my simulations or my analysis. Um, over time, I've started calling that faux versioning because it's really easy to lose one of your versions, to open up a, an old one, save it, and now it looks newer than an old one. So if it's old, old, and old, new, and new, old, and which one, which of the old, new, and new, old is the older, are they divergent solutions? Are they same thing? And if you saved one, just because you opened it, resaved it, and closed it, you're kind of stuck. Um, also, 
you might be doing analysis on one machine and another part of the analysis on another machine and they're out of sync and you have no way of centralizing that solution. The, the sad part of this is now, you, and let's go back to this, I'm gonna go back real quick, is your solutions, your data. Your data is now getting out of sync. So you might have a solution set that you want to save somewhere. And if you didn't have good records, maybe you're writing it down in an Excel sheet or doing something else, you're gonna have a really hard time proving any sort of provenance on your results if somebody ever called them into question. So if, if you published a result and you did not know for certain and have meticulous records, somebody could call into question and it could cause you a lot of headache, a lot of pain trying to prove that. The other side of it is from a organization, an institute, a company's point of view, they want to see the record so that if somebody does fudge the results, they can go back and they can see where these changes were. Um, so point is, is we've been going down a route historically. Um, and this software engineers were all at this point, then they got into other, some more advanced approaches. I'm seeing this a lot in a lot more scientific computing, getting into more advanced approaches, but not the adoption is still from what I've seen pretty low. Um, and when we get to that, that's in the next section. I'll talk about from what I've seen in my thoughts on why some of the adoption is low, but th this loss of golden ver it versions. So if you know that your version is the true version, it's stored in a system that doesn't let you change that version too easily, it's really hard to say that, hey, this isn't the result that's tied. Now, some questions we might also want to ask ourselves is, Traditional computing on a high performance computing box, maybe we want to do it there, maybe we don't. There's more options today than there were, you know, 10 years ago when I was in grad school. There's other things you have to think about. The more advanced approaches sometimes are more complex, more heavy lifting, and quite frankly, you know, it may not be of interest to anyone to go and manage those systems, so they're gonna stick with what they know. Um, with data, now when you come up with a solution, you, there may be live data, live data. If you're not tracking the exact version of the data that you use to generate your results, now that's another point in lineage that you're losing information. And it's really hard to go back and say, hey, this is where I was at before. backing up. Now, if you think of th in terms of an information lifecycle management process, if you want to back up your data, is it make sense to back up? Does it make sense to use another system that manages backups for you in another more advanced approach, um, labeling versions of the data and hiding the all except for the newest from you unless you're explicitly looking for it? Um, there's a lot of other approaches. So when it comes to data, now you're, we're at the point. We have simulations, we have analysis. The data we're using has different versions. It changes over time. Our result sets change. We want to be able to version that. There's some newer tools that are coming around, um, Quilt, DVC, to name a few, that do data version control using um, a modern equivalents of Hadoop's distributed file system, S3, Google Cloud Storage, um, Azure Blob, MinIO, and some of these um, distributed file systems that you can have in the cloud, or if you have a data center, you can install things like MinIO and have a, even on your own machine, you could install it and manage all that as an artifact repository. So, you know, I'm thinking back, this is where I was when, you know, when I was doing a lot more scientific computing, not a lot of version control, not a lot of real good, you know, unless I was extremely laborious in my rigor and spent, you know, wrote down or went, had an Excel file that tracked everything, it was really hard to track. So moving forward, when I got into more of the software engineering, I realized, I was like, well, there's, 
these version control systems. Here I, I have one that represents um, Git. Um, Git's not the only one, it's probably the de facto to use today. Past ones you have, Mer oh, whoops, Mercurial, um, SVN, um, TFS, and a dozen others. But Git and GitHub, GitLab, Azure DevOps, and the other dozen or so you know, services that you can use as a software as a service to work with Git allow you to start versioning your, your code. It allows you to collaborate with other people. So especially in these days where we're all working remote, we may not have easy access to our work machines if we have a, a, a workstation in the office. We may be able to remote into another machine, but there may not all of our results and all of our code may not have been on that machine. So using a version control system, we can get, get to that stuff. Thinking about now data. Now, if you start storing metadata about your data, so the version of the data, um, periods of um, timestamps, information that allows you to go back and re-pull the same exact data, recreate the same exact results, you start being able to get a lot more consistency and true reproducibility of your results. Um, you know, if you're doing a pure numerical simulation, storing the initial conditions that you use, or as I use more often, your configuration parameters, whether it's a, the initial values for a random number generator, the, the initial offset for a pendulum and so on, those are easy to store and those can you can store those in a version control no problem it's when you have larger data sets that you want to start analyzing real life data so if you were looking at um, videos of pin july swinging and you want to do some analysis off of them now what happens if somebody adds another video to that system and you rerun your analysis there's a chance that you may get different results so you need to know everything that went into it, all the different, this, uh, different values of your data or the, the state of the database at that point in time. So while there's approaches to work with these solutions, I'm seeing more and more adoption, but I haven't seen extreme, what I would call high adoption. There are still pockets of, I've never used version control, or it seems like a lot of extra work, or when they're using version control, they're actually checking in all of their, their data when they, so large data sets and they, if it's an on-premise data, um, sorry, if it is an on-premise um, version control system, there may be policies against that. You may get in trouble because you just threw tons of data, which could be sensitive into a version control system. And now there's no room left. Um, the other part that is missing is a lot more automation. If adoption of these systems is low, something that might help adoption is if there was a way to automate the use of cloud or even whether it's public cloud or private cloud, whatever, it could be at a uh, supercompute you know, station of some sort that has Kubernetes installed. It could be an on-premise cluster that has, that's HPC. But if there's ways that the institute or, or the company you work for puts a framework around automatically deploying your code into that, but in such a way that it's easy for you to work with the code, then you can, you, then you don't even have to worry about running the code on your own machine. You, write the code here, put it in a version control system, and then use an, a secondary system in there, commonly referred to as a CICD engine, to automate the deployment to those other systems. And by doing so, the code runs there. You don't even have to get to the point where you're, if it was HPC, worrying about writing a, a batch script that goes and automates and deploys the code for you. These frameworks, whatever they may be, should be able to handle that for you. 
So one thing that I don't know if folks here have know what MLOps is or has, have heard of MLOps. Uh, what about DevOps? Okay, so it, it, DevOps is a practice in agile software development that integrates the business, the process, culture, and to a great degree, what everybody pays attention to is the automation of the, the deployment of software. If you go to AWS and you, you look up, you'll find that they are deploying new versions of software on the second. And there, there's no human hardly involved in the actual deployment of that process. Somebody commits their code, it goes into a CI CD pipeline, and it gets deployed. There's advanced tools that allow them to safely undeploy or roll back to a previous version if something's bad. But it, it, it's, these, these are very complex systems that have a lot of um, safety built into them that the engineers just don't have to worry about. They have people that may help like site reliability engineers or DevOps engineers to help them in the case they need something different. Now, ML ops is taking those ideas and applying it to machine learning. Now, the whole, what you, has been called from time to time, the data science de development life cycle in contrast to a software development life cycle or data development life cycle. In the data science, it isn't, I've got a piece of software, I'm gonna deploy it and it's good for all time. You have a model, you deploy it, and then you start seeing things around concept drift or data drift. So if you have a model deployed and you start monitoring the distribution of the data and you see that the underlying distribution has shifted from, you know, from something that say it was Gaussian for uh, lack of the sake of argument at one time and now it's a Cauchy distribution. That model's gonna not be accurate anymore or maybe the centroid of your distribution has shifted right. Well, your model's still likely not gonna be correct. So you need to be able to retrain it. So that CI, CD, CT, or CI, CD becomes the CI, CT. So continual training. So you're always looking to retrain and update the model. Other things that came into this is more ideas around that data version control, result set management, so result set management in, um, in data science space or machine learning space is called model management. And there's a lot of common tools out there, Datmos, um, ML Studio, Azure ML, ML Flow, um, and go on. There, there's so many of these tools out there, but they're generally angled towards machine learning. And for generic scientific computing, they're, they're not, there isn't a lot of tools out there. But if you really dig down into what these tools are, all they are are advanced logging systems. So you're sitting there logging a parameter, logging a model, logging a, a, a data set, and now you have a, a bunch of stuff there that if you think about it, you could really engineer whatever you're working on to use one of these tools if you, if you so chose. Um, but yeah, one thing that these, these approaches try to aim is what I like to call raids. And from an architecture, you know, you start at the point of view, you start talking about qualities of your solution. Um, reusable means that you've got a solution. Reusable has different, different contexts. Reusable means the solution you have, you can hand off to somebody else and they can reuse it. Re, and get the same analysis, the same results you did. Reusable from a framework means that it's generic enough that a physicist could use it and a biologist could use the same thing, even though their, their computations and their workflows may be completely different. Um, auditable, so that's where it's saving your tell and your institute's tell by saying, it's looking at all the actions from the data that was input to the final results. And you can go back over time and look at what these changes were. So if you published with a XYZ version from your version control, that's always in that system. And if you say, I need to share this with somebody, well, now your result is shareable. So if you have a publication that says, I need to know 
what, you know, something from this that you need to share with me so I can reproduce the results. Well, you can say, I have the exact history of that result. It's using this code with these parameters on this data to get here, here it go. If it's just a piece of code, you can take the code that was used and send it off and say, here's some parameterizations we used. Immutable, nobody can go in and change it. You don't want somebody to go in and change old results, delete them, modify them, then you've now, if that were possible, you've destroyed the audit trail. So you restrict, some systems allow some, muta some mutation to the what's in the system, you restrict who can do that. So that when changes do happen, if they had to happen, you can trace back to who did it. Um, deployability, well, deployability really depends on who you're talking to, what deployability means. Shareable, so shareable is I have a collaborator or I need to put this with a publication, or I need to open source this. Now it's in a version control, maybe you're forwarding it onto another version control system that now you have this open source solution and somebody's gonna look at it and maybe it's reusable for them and so they're gonna adopt it. So going from MLOps, the word that was um, in my mind and um, was psychoops. Is scientific computing or scientific computing ops. Now, the ops side of a lot of scientific research is not a big player, unless you want to start using more cloud compute resources. If you want to be able to deploy your solution into a Kubernetes cluster on in Google Cloud, or at the San Diego Supercomputing Center, or on Azure, or on your own machine, then you don't hopefully don't want to have to deal with all building up that infrastructure, setting the security around it. You would hope that maybe there's a group that can help you build that. And some pieces of code, some a framework behind it that automates this. Now, I, th I think really my machine learning, taking that as just a subset of scientific computing, it's got all the glory these days, it seems, but, um, I always, this is maybe it's my own personal one. I was uh, always felt, I was like, well, data scientists, well, that's kind of like what computational science is, but to, but on steroids. Because I, it, the way I looked at it is data scientists generally work with black boxes. Computational scientists can build you that black box and use it. So they got, they got the next level tool set. So if you think of machine learning, instead of these tools like scikit-learn that everybody uses, half the time, those aren't even the best solution and maybe you have to write something from scratch. Or, you're, or in, in the computational science space, maybe you're working on newer algorithms and you wanna be able to deploy that. So using one of these out of the box tools that really caters to a black box isn't gonna help you. So you need something that is a little bit more hey, I have a new tool, I want to extend it, how do I do that? Now, so intersection, but there's a lot more in, the, in computational science or scientific computing. What does deployability mean here? Well, <laughs> that, that's, a, that's a good question. It's, it's generally you're not just deploying a machine learning model to a retail site to predict what somebody's gonna be spending or buying or how much they're willing to pay based on their previous purchase history. You're more interested in, well, maybe I have a new model and I just want to get the, the latest images. I want to get the new results from this and I want to be able to maybe automatically put them into a publication. So you're up, maybe you get super advanced and you say, I have this publication almost written. I'm just gonna insert the new image here and maybe build, have it automate your LaTeX build and send you the new image every single time you run this. It depends on how you want to address this. Um, I, you could get, you know, I, I could go crazy and start coming up with crazy solutions that nobody would use. That's something that I like to do. Um, but I also like to come up with things that are useful. But in, you know, in psycho ops, I think there's going to be fewer black boxes. Maybe we need some black boxes there things that automate the hard stuff. Let us do the fun stuff. So 
going back, this is just kind of overview of, the, of RAIDs again. You know, tying your results back to configuration, versions of code, your, the data, and so on. Making sure that you can have an audit history, you can roll things back, you can look at what's happened. That your results can't be changed and fudged as you go along. You know, deployability here is thinking of another way I think of deployability is deploying automated analysis. So you, you have a, a result that you're trying to do, you're trying to do an ensemble computation on this, something that's embarrassingly parallel, or you're trying to search over a grid to identify parameters that are part of a bigger scheme. You want a way of just saying, I'm gonna deploy this, I'm gonna walk away, I'm gonna go get a coffee, I'm gonna have a beer, I'm gonna do whatever, and then I'm gonna come back tomorrow and have my results, but I'm gonna get an email if something failed, I'm gonna get a, a, an SMS text if it failed, maybe I'm using um, the Slack or um, Microsoft Teams and I wanna have chat ops so that it alerts me when my results are done. Maybe you have collaborators and that's how they know things are done even though they might not have known you were running a new analysis. You want then shareability, you know, make it easy. Make things easy to share no matter what that is. Okay, so I've talked a lot about these things, so I'm just gonna go over it real quick. What we need is a system that can run code remotely, let us have our desktops, make it so that we don't have to have a $15,000 desktop to be able to do analysis. Maybe you could use your research funds to run it somewhere in a high performance computing or cloud compute or whatnot at a fraction of that cost, have a smaller device and maybe use funds for additional, additional, you know, maybe, maybe the computers you would be buying can now, you can support another postdoc. Another, if you, if you use the cloud and now it's a centralized point, you're not worrying about moving data from one machine to another machine to another machine. If you have five machines that you're doing analysis on, spin up something in the cloud, do the analysis, use their persistent storage layers, shut that machine down when you're not using it and you can move on. So you can start getting to ephemeral compute situations and things start getting interesting and almost becomes fun. Templates, um, I'm gonna talk about that a little bit again, uh, later on. It, there's a big part and I think this is a good thing that's come out of the machine learn, learning phenomenon is, or data science phenomena is cookie cutter, uh, or concepts around that, or having a templated project repository that you get then create a new copy of it, and maybe across your whole research group, you say, everybody, we're using this format, let's be consistent, and people, different people get come on, they get into the code, they can see what's going on, and now maybe, everybody's on the same page and they know what they're looking at when they look at the code. The other thing is logging all your results. Um, logs are that immutable layer as well. That's a big part of it. Everything you do gets logged. You can't delete those logs. They're persistent. Um, decoupling solutions. A lot of traditional solutions here will be very heavily coupled to you have to know how the back end works just to do something on the front end here do something on the front end care less about what happens in the back end let somebody else manage where the compute is happening have another team working on that your solution if the compute environment fails you should be able to self-heal so if your if the node you were on dropped and died out you don't want to find out a week later when you come back that your, that your solution's just been sitting there, not running, not getting results because one of the nodes failed. You want to, it to re, be able to restart, maybe restart on a different node or restart that node. And if it failed so many times, maybe it now fails, but it lets you know. Have a declarative configuration. So the different steps you go in your analysis, you need to be able to declare I'm doing this and then this and then this and then this. A lot of times you may have five different ways and you know you have your favorite pieces that you want to do along the way and you've set up one processing flow with one 
another processing flow on another, another, and then you have all these different pieces of code that you're running. If you can create a configuration that declares this, then you end up having a lot more, um, you get away from having to write code so much and allow somebody else to have the code written that takes that de declarative configuration and builds out the pipeline in a consistent way for you. You, you get abstracted away from what the actual infrastructure is. This, all of these different things together start building a separation of con concerns. Okay. Interesting. So I think I had another, so I had a bunch of images on here. Let me, oh well. Let me refresh this, see if it, they come up. Okay, so something happened there. Um, start bringing in different pieces of technology. So these are, these are the things that I'm looking at every day. I look at different pieces of technology that may fit into a solution. Version control, I don't do anything but get anymore because I, I think there's, you know, in the consulting space, I've had one client in the last year that I've heard about using something other than Git, and they had wished that they had done otherwise. Um, CI, CD, there's a lot of tools out there. Ones I've been playing around is um, GitLab Runners and Spinnaker. Spinnaker is something that came out of Netflix. Netflix is great for all these little pieces of technology that come out of there that they kind of drive where everybody's going, as well as um, Google. Kubernetes has taken over a lot of the compute space with cloud native computing. Google, you know, it, uh, so I, I've been, this, the stuff I've been doing in the last couple of weeks is, is with Google's, but I work with Azure, AWS, you name it. it nothing's off the table. It, it depends on what I'm doing, when I'm doing it, on where I choose to work these days. Um, distributed compute. Um, who here has used Spark out of curiosity? Okay. Um, so Spark was probably, and to some extent, is probably the most used component of the whole Hadoop stack at this time. It's used heavily in data engineering, especially for very large data sets. It allows you to do things with data at a very large scale that you generally could not do before without having a very expensive um, um, data warehouse, like Netiza or a Teradata system. Now, Spark ran on Hadoop, allowed you to scale out your compute across tens to dozens of, of different compute nodes. It was very high level very focused on data engineering. They then built a machine learning model on it. Some people like it, some people don't. Um, a lot of the data scientists that got used to scikit-learn and pandas was another data processing tool, found its API so different that they, the, that they didn't adopt it unless they had to because of scale. Now, on these other ones, Dask and Ray, are allowing you to use tools that are either wrappers of scikit-learn or have the exact same API and be able to do it at that same scale. So they're lower level. Now, what's cool about them being lower level is you can do a lot more scientific computing in it. You're not stuck with the data engineering, data frame level or ML things that look somewhat like scikit-learn but is enough different to bother a data scientist. And you can go to Dask and Ray. Dask and Ray, have that really cool API. Um, now, there's a, there's a place for all of them. If you are still doing pure data engineering, Spark is gonna be a lot easier to use than Dask. It, it just is at this point. But if you're going to other things like cloud data warehouses or BigQuery, Snowflake, there's yeah, other tools you can do that allow you to write things in SQL and that, open it up so you don't have to have as specialized skills and you can get somebody that just knows SQL to do most of the work. Now, orchestrating your, your pipelines. I want to go, I want to compute this data set after I've done that computation. I want to 
average them out. I want to do this and maybe I have 10 of these and I get those results, all those results and then I do something else with them. And you start building this pipeline, whether you may realize it or not, you're building out a sequence of steps in how you're doing your code. To do these things in the cloud in a more beneficial way and repeatable way so that you can break down these components, maybe it's a function you have that does something very specific and maybe it takes that one function an hour to run. Well, you can use orchestration tools, Airflow, from, which is an Apache um, um, product, um, Argo, Prefect, and so on. There's, there's dozens of these things out there that allow you to then do this compute in a way that you can visualize the steps that are going on, where it fails. Uh, some of them will even allow you to say, okay, I'm gonna go and rerun it. So you click on a button, and you rerun the analysis. So maybe it failed, but you think that failure was, was unwarranted. So you can go and say, I'm gonna force it to rerun anyways. So getting, getting my um, architect hat on for a little bit, I started you know, saying, if I were to build out this system, something that I could reuse is not targeted only at machine learning, and I could build any scientific computing pipeline that I can imagine in this, then I'm gonna, I, I, I'm gonna have a few different things. I'm gonna say I have a cookie cutter project template, and I'll show you guys what a cookie cutter kind of looks like here. Um, I know time's getting close, so Jose, um, if, I, if you need me to cut, give me the, the signal. Um, um, I, I probably have libraries, SDKs, frameworks, other tools that I'm using. This could be Python, it could be um, MATLAB, it could be R, it could be C. Th these are things that are input that you're, you're gonna reuse. So you need to store that configuration with that. So you need a way of saying, here's the pieces, the libraries that I'm using, the versions I'm using, not just any version, but the exact version I'm using. I'm gonna store it there, any configurations. So Configuration here, that ends up becoming a key part to be able to have this right. If you look here, this is representing a pipeline where you have one step that splits into two different steps, then they merge into another, and then this fourth may do something and then sa saves it out to a data set. But to get from I wrote code to the code is running here, you need something out here, and this I'm calling it a build library, that takes this information automatically builds up all the different pieces here. I'm using Kubernetes, so I have Docker, which is a virtualized operating system um, that you can put each piece of code. So if you break your, your solution down that I have a single piece of code that does something, it reads in a file, does something, writes it out. It uses using similar to what's called like a map reduce paradigm. Take that result, build it into this image. The image can then be put into a version control system, not unlike uh, Git, but there's version control systems. Generally, they're called a, a registry or a hub that hold these OS images. Then I want to build a, another thing that's called a, a Argo workflow here. Um, these are YAML files in Kubernetes that Kubernetes likes to call manifests. If you start reading more about Kubernetes, you can find everything or almost everything in there has a combination of Greek and Greek, Greek maritime terminology. You have things like Argo, Helm, Kubernetes itself, Prometheus, all these things go back to ancient Greece. Um, and then afterwards you have this step that you can call continual analysis. It's you deploy the solution here and you analyze it. So part of the infrastructure, you have these other tools up here. Prometheus is a login and monitoring solution. So maybe the ops team set something up there and you can see. Fluent D is also part of the logging, so would be part of a logging solution. It collects logs that you may just be writing out to the file system or standard IO, and it starts capturing that and putting that somewhere else. So these ephemeral pieces, once they're gone, they're not lost. You may need them to go and debug something. Argo, oops, okay. Yeah. So, Argo is a uh, orchestration and workflow management tool. Dask is that parallel compute, distributed compute. So you can have these things set up in a Kubernetes cluster that you could go from, I have something that's two, it's two 
um, two virtual machines and it's running across that. So now you have a really small supercomputer. Think about it that way. To now I have 150, 200, 300 nodes that I'm now sending my job out across those. As soon as those are done, it can shut down. Okay. I don't think I can hear the, see the chat on this. So um, if you, I'll look. Okay, now my, okay. Now I got it. Sorry, guys. You have all these different pieces in here and now all your storage, you can think of the storage here as you have Google Cloud Storage or a SQL databases or these NoSQL databases, things like MongoDB or in Google, it'd be Firestore or Data Store. Um, monitoring, alerting. So this may be something for whoever's maintaining these systems, they're watching. Maybe you have your own views on this, so you're watching the jobs that run. Um, user interfaces, maybe, for example, Argo comes with a user interface, Prometheus, you have these other dashboards called like Grafana. So it, you can start looking at those pieces. Dask also has a UI that could be stood up. So there's, there's a lot of really kind of cool things that you can start getting into. Um, now, things that go into this, cookie cutter. So cookie cutter just looks like a file system that you set up, directories and files. It uses what's called Jenja templating. It's these little curly braces around things. You create this template, you put it into a Git repository, you install cookie cutter. And when you download, when you then you can call cookie cutter on that repository, it will pull it down and it'll ask you to fill in. It says, what is repo name? Type in what repo name is. What is EDA? You type in what EDA is. So maybe there's a standard format and you can put defaults. Sometimes you want to override them because maybe you're not it, it doing model validation. There's something else that's going on. But it doesn't mean that you only have these. Maybe you add more. And this is, like I say, machine learning is a use case. The, these are things that are more specific to a data science pipeline. You're doing some data processing, that data munging, data collecting. That's all the data engineering stuff. Feature engineering, creating new features. Selecting the most important features. Training a model making sure that model is validate, valid. So maybe you're doing a five-fold cross-validation and then serving it. Serving it can mean many, many things. It's saying I'm running across another data set to, to predict it, or it's deploying a REST API in front of a machine learning model. Here, it, I set something up that has these workflows that has uh, this flows YAML that says these are the pipelines that are active or inactive. And then I have this collection of different pipelines. So out of all of these, I may have took, okay, <laughs> I see. Thanks, Ricardo. Um, and, you know, build out the, these things. So let me just jump through these real quick. Now, when you build out these libraries, you want it to be flexible enough that you're not forcing everybody to use exactly how it's done, to be able to rearrange things, have different depths of those folders. and have a little bit more, um, you know, it's not an iron hammer that everything goes like this. Hopefully, you know, you're not going to get everybody to be a fan of it at front first, but input, you can be, you have a gradual continual improvement on these things. Um, Pre-baked CICD pipelines. So the CICD, hopefully that's something you would never have to worry about writing one of these. It's something it's referenced, it runs it, it deploys it, you're done. You don't have to, it, it does everything for you. Um, I'm just going to, this is kind of a, you know, high level picture of the library and all the code that goes into building that build that automates the deployment. There's a lot of different things from logging to managing connections to databases to templates for Kubernetes and Argo and Docker and so on. Um, I, and at some other time, if somebody wants to talk about these things, I would have no problem getting on a call and talking about these. Um, This is kind of another look at what a CI CD CA pipeline is. It goes through various steps from testing, making sure the code is correct, to deploying it, to executing the analysis. Um, so I'm going to go and look at two things. So I went and I created this is an, um, you guys aren't going to be able to see the code. It's going to be super small for you guys. Um, 
Never show a piece of code. Yeah, I don't care. <laughs> well, it's, uh, it's, not, it's not possible to see it. Uh, yeah, I, I can it's, see it. You can see it? No. Okay. Depends and on your mean, screen. I mean, not everybody might have the same resolution screen, but it, yeah. it, it was visible. Okay, let me. But it's not advised to show code. <laughs> Let me, let me, I'm looking for my share button again. Is it still showing? No. Okay, I am, oh, there. All right, yeah. Anyway, I will go, the other thing I want to show is Argo, right? So I talked about it creating pipelines. So this was a deployment of a, a it was a mocked up, the point um, data science pipeline where it goes from ingesting data merging a bunch of different data so doing some joins doing some feature engineering merging those results doing a, a, a train test split and then doing uh, training two separate models so I can go to this and I'll set resubmit so I'll rerun this whole pipeline and you, you can watch where it goes if one branch failed you would see it it would turn red so you can say it's mocked. It goes really quick because there's no real work going on here. Now, if you had, and it comes to end, there you are. Oh, it does the validation, my bad. If you went in here, you can see that there'll be different pipelines. So the history of everything you've done, you can come in here and go, okay, I want to look at what's pending. So maybe there's a backlog. It can't run everything because you've, you've hit a limit on your queue. Um, you can look at what's running and just see the current things. You can things that have failed. So, on. so you can, you know, kind of look at all your analysis. These, there's other tools that like MLflow that allow you to, if it was machine learning, you can look at the results of each of your simulations. And you can look at, you can put families of simulations together and compare apples to apples and see which result is better without having to open up a file and go, oh, this one, this one, this one. It, you can, it'll show visually what's better. It generates a lot of the graphs for you. It's just, there's a lot of tools like, even if you don't do the, a full automation like this, that you can even use on your own machine. If you say, well, I'm not ready to automate something in the cloud. I would still want to run it locally. You can get much better at how you maintain your results even locally with a local Git. Okay. Um, yeah, so I think we're at time, but I'll say one, one last thing. Um, all of this being said, there's more advanced concepts and probably the key of these is in a job control framework that when your data or your parameters are changed, and it could be an external party that somehow changes these, once those change, your workflows could automatically restart. So if these are systems, the solutions that are working on data that is collected from some other process, they could trigger a re-execution of your pipeline. If um, others is, if you did 10 different pipelines, but they had a 50% overlap, you, you don't wanna have to manage each one of those. You would wanna be able to manage them separately and let the framework behind go, oh, this has already been computed. This has already been computed. This one computed it. These two don't need to. Let it manage it and keep them separate. So it could kind of be a little bit more intelligent. Those are, that's kind of the forefront of where these systems want to get. I don't know of anything that's doing that to a great extent. The data version control solution does some of that. Something I have personally, I have not played with that solution yet. So I can't say whether it works great, well, or not at all. Um, I, I don't think they'd say they can do it without being able to do it, but I don't know what, what systems they actually fully support. So, this is just one one of many things that um, that you know I like to talk about. But um, is there any questions? Any? All right. Thank you, John. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. So let's uh, get some questions. I think Terry had a question. Uh, he put it on the chat. 
Uh, okay. If you can reread the question or interpret your question, maybe you can answer it. Let me see if I can get the, okay, now I'll move this out, okay. Now I can see the chat, okay. So who was it that asked, you said? Terry? Oh, hey, Terry. Yeah, so Terry, yeah, this is something that um, I was just, I, I've worked on building systems like this over the last two, three years. This particular one, is, I just put together where it's at in the last two weeks. So I've got it to where it's building stuff, some of the actual, the and, um, and so that's working to some extent but the, I'm working on the full on deployment and integration through security and um, um, roles provisioning to get it to work within uh, Kubernetes specifically and, and Google. Um, there is another question by Magic Man. So he, before you answer your question, can you just summarize the question so the other people can know what you're talking about when you're answering? Yeah. So, how do you use ML with Git, Maven IDs, automated testing? Uh, okay. So how do you use ML with Git? So I guess the, the they're saying, you know, if I'm working within a, a development environment, an IDE, how do I do unit testing or um, automated testing, meaning I want to make sure the code is working correctly? And with Git. So that's where these continual integration, continual deployment frameworks come in for one. You first, you would have to write tests against how you expect your code to behave. Now with machine learning or any data problem in general, you have to be able to break down your code and have inputs that you know expected outputs. So any type of scientific computing um, data related problem, you have to have given an input, you know what the output should be. Um, how do you do that against an entire pipeline? That's where things can get tricky. Um, in general, the whole point of machine learning is you don't know what the solution should be given the inputs unless it's a really a toy problem. Um, Maven ID, any IDE. So um, personally, I use whether it's PyCharm v or VS Code. Um, that that now Argo, Argo does have a continual deployment. I guess you could call it component where you can use Argo to build this test and deployment pipeline as well. That is another thing that can be done with Argo. Um, but that is not what I'm using Argo for. I'm using Argo to orchestrate the different steps in a pipeline. If you were using scikit-learn, scikit-learn comes with some pre-baked components um, that allow you to build a pipeline inside of it. But Argo here is for, I'm using it because a lot of times you don't necessarily want to have a long running piece of code and when it fails in the middle, you're hosed. You want to be able to say this failed at one point and I can restart from where it broke. Argo it, it is used to that level of orchestration. And that, so I'm building pipelines in Argo in that sense so that I could, if I knew this failed and this took three weeks to get to that point, I can step back and write a pipeline that just runs the, from where it broke. Um, yeah, so yeah, uh, another one, yeah. So these CICD tools, um, Jenkins is probably the workhorse that's been standard. Um, GitLab has its own tool. GitHub has recently copied there and has built their own CICD framework called Actions. Azure DevOps has pipelines. Um, 
AWS, GCP, they have their own cloud build solutions and so on. So. CI I have a question for, for John. Uh, you can just speak through your uh, mic, just yeah. on, on muted, uh, oh, or you sorry. can actually put it in the chat. I'm sorry, Jose, that was meant for. <laughs> So, any other questions? Um, John, uh, this is Mark Flieger. I'm, uh, hey, Mark. I'm hi. Um, I gave a talk last week on uh, MEG. I was interested that you worked with uh, probably Rich Capola at uh, NIMH. At yep. MEG yep. Core there. He was one of my two postdoc advisors. Yeah, well, that's great. Well, you, you know, these kinds of labs generate huge amounts of data. Yes. And um, so um, <clears throat> the company I work for, uh, Cortex Solutions, works mainly with EEG labs. So these are smaller labs than MEG labs. Yeah. <clears throat> and these, uh, uh, all the stuff you've talked about is really cool stuff, but it's like overwhelming. And, and the, the smaller labs don't have the resources to even hire someone like you. And, but even though they're EEG and not MEG, but they're generating tons of data. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, it'd be great to have some kind of a framework like the one you're talking about, where someone, there's so many choices at each step, right? Like all these yeah. tools you mentioned, all these many alternatives for this yeah. and that. It'd be great to have like a um, lab management system or something that could organize their data, then they could share it with other small labs, do mm -hmm. combined analyses, uh, mine their data with machine learning and so on and so forth. <clears throat> I'll, but, I'll tell you uh, the trick that happens with those, especially when you start bringing in biomedical stuff, anything that has a potential human and sometimes animal component, especially human when you get HIPAA in there. And then you have IRB yeah. protocols that yep. have to be filed so somebody can access it and where you can store the data. For example, Google, um, unless it's changed and I, and I haven't noticed it is, you could not put HIPAA data that needed to be um, quote unquote HIPAA compliant inside a data store. So you have to be careful where you're putting data even when you're going to some of these solutions. Right, um, yeah. well, um, Aside from that, I mean, yeah. I, I know that that's important. <clears throat> Let's say you're just within a lab. Okay. And you've got, you generated this tons of data and um, you want to reanalyze the same data uh -huh. um, in a new way. Yes. Uh, start mining it before you run your next study. Mm -hmm. And right now these labs are all shut down. They're, they're not running any new experiments. Oh, yeah. So they're sitting on maybe mountains of data, but they're not um, able to generate new data, which is what- Do you know what, do they know what data they have? It'd be great to have something like you're talking about yeah. da with data, um, data revision control. But of course, yeah. with these tons of data, you start with some raw data and then you go down the chain and you generate a whole bunch of intermediate yes. things, but you don't wanna, you don't want to change the raw data that you started with. Things yes. Like that. And so, anyhow, so, yeah. Yeah, so you start, you, raw data comes in, it puts it into some, let's call it a landing site. It lands there. Then you have another process that looks for or it gets triggered when a data, data lands there. It then pulls that up. It starts collecting one, it starts a train of metadata there. It starts tracking the lineage of where it is and when a new, pro so now that you've landed the data there, you wanna process it, put it in another form, and there's downstream processes that have to happen. So you can build something, whether it's like this or a little bit uh, more, I'm gonna plug into to this process approach. And then you start end up with these data or job control frameworks. So um, I guess sort of the bottom line is that every little lab that we work with would not yeah. be able to make one of these things. But would it be yes. possible to come up with sort of a, um, a cookie cutter version yeah. of, of what you're talking about that could be um, deployed 
in different labs so that they could organize Sounds it. like a good opportunity for an open source product. Yeah. You know, you're saying smaller labs, they're not going to have necessarily the financial means for these big enterprise solutions. Um, there's going to be some stuff out there that can do parts of that, but for the smaller labs, they need something that they can afford to, to use free, hopefully. Um, and but it needs you know, to be maintained. And, and actually, yes. I work for a company, so we need to get paid somehow, too. So we need yes. to figure that out. Uh, well, you work for a company, so. Yes, yes, yeah. always. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so anyhow, it's fascinating. All right, um, so um, I will uh, defer further questions since uh, John is also a co-host. If anybody wants to stay on and John wants to stay on, then you can keep on going. But at this point, I can just uh, uh, let everybody go if they don't want to keep on uh, here. And I'd like to thank John again for taking the time to speak to us. Uh, thank you very much, John. No, Thank you very and, much, Ricardo. I want to yeah. I want to thank everybody for uh, attending and the participation. And uh, John, thank you very much. And let's keep in touch. We are organizing a, now a workshop. We're trying to put together a workshop with alumni from the CSRC to share with our current students and industry affiliates uh, different aspects of career path that everybody has taken. So mm -hmm. we are actually. Uh, approaching 100 graduates in our PhD program, plus uh, I think 43 master students. So, so we have a, now a decent uh, size of alumni, and we want to keep the alumni to, uh, uh, closely uh, connected with the CSRC. Enjoy the Christmas lights. <laughs>